I'm Pastor JP. Welcome. We are so glad you are checking us out online. We hope the word you're about to hear is an encouraging point in your life today. So we're praying for you. We love you. Stay tuned. Well, if you have your Bible, if you're seated, you can take those to Deuteronomy chapter 32. As we begin a new series today on the mountaintop experiences that I believe can offer us some powerful lessons. And I know the moment you throw out the word school, probably start making some people nervous. Summit school. So there's been some prolific encounters recorded in scriptures that have happened on top of mountains. And so some of those timeless truths, none of the other encounters that have happened all over the place, but we wanted to take a look at some of the mountaintop ones. And so those summits are the ones that are going to take us to school. And I thought, well, since we had just went through a series where we were looking at Moses in the beginning of him starting a whole new phase of life there with the burning bush, I thought, well, why don't we kind of start this series and put a kind of like a a period on the life of Moses? And so we'll, we'll kind of put a period on Moses, but start this series. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, now unfortunately to do that, that means we're going to start this series out with a, with a pretty, well, we're going to get one of the hard lessons out of the way right out the gate. That sound all right to you? Y'all going to have to help me this morning. Y'all awful, y'all awful quiet. And so we're going to go stand on Mount Nebo. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go stand on these mountains. And we're going, we're going to see if we can learn the lessons there. Now, now listen, we're not going to go and dissect the, the mountain and, and, and try to find all the little lessons and points. Because most of the time, these experiences don't have a bunch of points to them. They have a point. And so we're, we're going to try to see if we can get a hold of that and what it might speak to to us Moses learns a very valuable lesson about dealing with disappointment on Mount Nebo and so I've never been more excited today to to speak on disappointment so that's what we're going to do but I tell you after the first service I don't think I've ever had so many people come up to me and tell me how much they needed this word. So it's up to you to make up your mind right now what you want to do with it. I guess it's up to you every Sunday. So Deuteronomy chapter 32. Start with verse 38. On the same day, a 48, 48, 32, 48. Would you hand me my bottle of water before I read, please? Give it up for my mama. This is my mama, y'all. I am going to get a whooping. On that same day, the Lord told Moses, go up into the Abram range to the Mount Nebo in Moab and across from the Jericho and view Canaan, the land I am given, giving, sorry, went country there, giving the Israelites as their own possession. And there on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Or. 
and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribeth Kadesh in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore, you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel. And this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir, and he shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with myriads of holy ones from the south and from his mountain slope. Surely it is you who love the people. All the holy ones are in your hand and at your feet. They all bow down and from you receive instruction. Look over at chapter 34. And then Moses climbed Mount Nebo. And from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. And there the Lord showed him the whole land. From Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Song, Balm, and as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. And I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross over into it. Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. And as the Lord has said, buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite of Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where the grave is. And Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. And the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. And now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. And so the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt? To Pharaoh and to all his officials and to the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Put your hand there on your word or on your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, please. Amen. All the places you will go, you'll be on your way up, you'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who'll soar the high heights. It was just recently Dr. Seuss's birthday. A lot of elementary schools doing the marathon readings. It's kind of become a thing I've noticed nowadays at high school graduations. The high school graduates getting copies of all the places you will go by Dr. Seuss. Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas writing little notes on the cover. All the places you'll go. So much promise in young boys and girls heading off to college or vocation schools or heading off into careers. All the places you'll go, all the things you'll experience. you got your whole life ahead of you. All the places you'll go. I mean, it's, it's symbolic, you know. I don't even know if they ever actually cracked the book open, you know. You 18, 19, 20-something-year-olds, all the places you go. I think, I think, I think, though, that there's probably a, 
a wider demographic that that book could appeal to, though. Because if you actually read the book, I think it could, I think the book can make it in a much wider demographic. I think it can make it in the 30s and 40s and the 50-year-old demographic, too. Because the title could as, could as well been all oh, the places you'll not go. Because if you've read the book and actually listened to what it says, I mean, yeah, you'll be on your way. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. Except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. How many 30 and 40s and 50-year-olds say, yeah, I say that could reach my demographic. I mean, yeah, you, you experience some, some great sights, you you see some things, you experience some great things, but you also will experience some, some sad things. Not everybody that gets on a knee gets the yes from the girl. Not everybody that makes the application for the house gets a yes from the loan department. Not, not everybody that, that applies to the school gets a yes from the admissions office. Not everybody that, that applies for the, for the job gets a yes. I don't know, maybe all y'all did. Anybody got a witness? No, you, I mean, you experience some great things, but you also will have to deal with some doors that slam in your face. Maybe we're just a little too prideful to admit it in church. All right, be that way. So Moses Here's from God. They're getting close. They've, they've come to the edge of the promised land. God tells Moses, I want you to climb up to, to Mount Nebo. I want you to climb. Now understand, Moses is 120 years old. Climbing anything would be a feat. But the Bible says Moses is pretty strong. Sight and strength, still there. Good for him. So Moses climbs. Now the Avon Range, it's got a lot of peaks. Pretty big range. There are a lot of peaks that didn't require a whole lot of climbing. So it's no wonder that God says, but I want you to go to Pisgah Peak, <laughs> which is like, one of the highest ones, if not the highest one. So God tells Moses, now Moses, I want you to go to Pisgah Peak. I want you to get to the, pretty much the highest point you possibly can. And Moses is like, okay. So he climbs up, 120 years old, to the, the highest place he can. He's pretty much getting to a place where there is no way his view can be impeded. There is no obstruction to his view. There's, there's, no, there's nothing there that can be in the way. And while he's there, he is, I believe he is given supernatural sight. There's no way with natural eyes he can see everything that the Bible says he saw. And so I believe God gave him supernatural sight so that he could see everything he saw. It's as if God gave him supernatural binoculars that he could see from Ephraim to Naphtali and everything in between. And so God gives him supernatural sight. Look at the promise, Moses. 
Look at it all. Look how beautiful and flush it is. It's like, it's like one of those little binoculars when you go to a state park and you're up on top of a huge mountain and you put the quarter in and you can look in and you can see the whole landscape. Moses is looking at the promised land and he can see it all and there's no obstruction to his view. And it is an extraordinary vision. And God shows off this promise that Moses has been longing for for 40 years. And God says, see, see the promise, Moses, see it all, take it all in. See what my people are inheriting. But not you. I'm kind of thinking to myself, I would have been lying. You know, Lord, you could have told me this in the text. You could have told me this like at the foot of the mountain. You, you could have left me down there. You you brought me all the way up here, showed me all of this, to what, rub it all in my face? You, 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 brought, you gave me supernatural sight so I can see it all. This is what I've been longing for all my life, I mean for the last 40 years at minimum, all the twists and turns and, and my leadership and, and all of this that I have been trying to navigate for the last 40 years, I can't imagine the severe emotional trauma that would have been wrapped up in this moment. This is a deep, personal moment. Listen, this is deeply personal. I need you to go there and stand on Mount Nebo with Moses. And what that must have felt like. What that must have been like. Moses has been with God for a long time. But he has never been this close to the promised land. And he is right there. Right there. So what is God doing? Because it is not like God to be cruel. It's not like God to be like, here it is, but you'll not step foot into it. Well, what, is, what is going on here? What's happening in this moment? Well, God mentioned what brought them up to this moment. We read it some years earlier. Some years earlier, the people were grumbling and the people were becoming unruly and getting upset with Moses due to a lack of water and supply. And Moses was getting angry with the people because they were getting doubtful that God would come through and mistrust, and, and there was mistrust growing between God and mistrust growing that Moses was speaking for God and that Moses knew what he was doing and started grumbling, must I always save the day? Must I always intercede? Must I always be the one to come in and fix things? And God told Moses to speak to the rock. You remember that story? God told Moses to speak to the rock, but instead of speaking to the rock, Moses in his anger, he, he struck the rock. Because that's one way God had instructed him in the past. So he struck the rock, and water flowed, and the people drank. But God said, no, 
No, that is not what I said. And so for his disobedience, God said, so now you don't get to go into the promised land. Whoa, 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 whoa. That seems a little bit severe. So he hit, he, he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock, and now he doesn't get to, like, go into the promised land for all of that. Now, listen, God gave the ex. We read it. It wasn't that he just disobeyed. The Bible says because he was called to leadership and he confused the people because he didn't sanctify that moment. That was, he didn't, he didn't show the holiness of the moment unto the Lord. In other words, the people were confused about who brought the water out. Who brought the water out, God or Moses? And there could be no doubt who was leading the people. And in this moment, there could be no doubt who was leading the people into the promised land, and it was not Moses. Moses is not the hero of the story. God is. God is. And so there on Mount Nebo, Moses is dealing with this disappointment. And I can't help but think that this, that that moment is running through his heart and mind. We've all have probably stood in our Mount Nebo moments. We have probably all stood in those moments where we've been rejected, didn't pass, didn't make it, didn't finish. We've all stood in moments of, uh, of, of heartbreak and severe disappointment. And we, we stand in those Mount Nebo moments and the darkness begins to gather. And in those disappointing moments, it usually manifests in anger. And that's what happened to Moses the first time. And he struck the rock and he paid dearly for it. Now listen to me, friends. Angry people are often just severely disappointed people. And I'm not talking about they didn't get the parking spot at the Kroger disappointed. I'm not, I'm not talking about had to send the steak back because it wasn't cooked right kind of disappointed. I'm talking about heart-wrenching, life-altering, being kicked in the gut, disappointment. That is easy to see in others, but hard to see in ourselves. It's hard to self-detect this kind of seething anger underneath the surface. Where, where we haven't dealt with with disappointment, where we haven't let God deal with our disappointment until one day it either erupts outwardly in rage or implodes inwardly into depression. Because if I were Moses, I would have marched off that mountain grabbed anything I could and just start hitting people. Because who cares what they would have thought of me then? Y'all get to go in. Y'all leaving me behind. I don't care what y'all think of me now. Who cares what y'all write of me now? Y'all probably gonna forget about me. Y'all get to go and I don't. Probably would have just tore into everybody. Y'all were the, I don't know about you, but I would have marched down that mountain probably with tears in my eyes, screaming at him, saying, it's y'all's fault. I don't get to go in. I would have blamed every single one of them. Y'all were the reason I hit the rock to begin with. I would have blamed every single one of them, but he didn't do that. See, I told you, these are, these are, this is summit school. These lessons are going to challenge you to grow up. See, this is a maturity. 
This is a maturity that's, that's rare, but we're called to get to. How, how did Moses get to a place to be this kind of mature in the Lord? That he didn't walk off that mountain and just beat everybody with a stick. Or the opposite. How, why, why didn't he just throw himself off of Pisgah Peak? Or why didn't he just walk down off of it and wallow in self-disappointment? Because so often that's what we do. We lash out or we turn inward because we don't know how to deal with our Mount Nebos. We don't know how to deal with disappointment. And I believe what God's showing Moses is, is that he's not afraid of our disappointments. He's, God's not afraid to deal with our disappointments, even if it's with him. He's like, listen, Moses, I know you and I, we got some issues, and I know your disappointment, but come, I know you're disappointed, but come on, we're going up there anyway. We're going to deal with this. He's not afraid. He's not afraid to go there with you. Why did God take him up there? Because when you allow God to lift your perspective, your disappointments lose its power. It doesn't take it away. It just loses its power. It loses its power over you. Because what you're experiencing isn't your central reality. It's not the central reality of your life. The rest of Moses' life didn't revolve around what happened on Mount Nebo. He didn't let what happened on Mount Nebo swallow him up. He saw what was happening. He saw the big picture. Look at all those tents. Look at all those hundreds of thousands of people. Look at the plan of God coming into fruition. He saw the big picture. And that that moment didn't define moment, didn't define Moses' life. That life's major disappointments are painful, but what God has appointed is still power. Isn't that what we read? Isn't that what we read? Moses didn't go in, but what was recorded? What was recorded? That he stood in front of Pharaoh and brought a whole nation, the most powerful nation on the earth, to its knees. What was appointed? That he watched a whole nation of slaves march out of Egypt with the wealth of that nation in his hands. I say that's a pretty good appointment. What was appointed? That he saw water stand up on his end and he walked through on dry ground. I say that's a pretty good appointment. And then for 40 years, he saw God lead them and shade them by a, by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Manna fell from the sky. Quail fed them from the sky. He was given the law of God. He talked with God, often was sensed and led by the presence of God, was known by God, experienced all kind of miracles like no other person ever had. I say great was the appointment of Moses, that his appointments far outweigh this disappointment. And I say the same is probably true for you. It's probably true for you. That you can't let the Mount Nebo moments of your life swallow you up and forget about all those powerful moments of appointment. Yeah, there's disappointment. But you can't forget about what was appointed and the power there. You got to let God lift your perspective so those disappointments lose their power. They don't go away, it just loses its power. We read in 33, surely it is you, God, who love the people. All the holy ones are in your hand. At your feet, they all bow down and from you, Receive instruction. See, if you know God's hand is in everything, you can leave everything in God's hand. 
when you're in God's hand, you're in God's hand. When you're in God's hand, you're in God's hand. You don't accidentally slip out of God's hand, even in disappointment. Plans change. Dreams get crushed. It happens. It happens. But it doesn't mean you're not still safe in God's hand. That the promise may still be way over there. And even though you're still way over here, you're still safe. What did it say? What did we read? Did you catch that in, in 34? It said in verse 6, in verse 5, it says, The servant Moses of the Lord died there in Moab, as the Lord has said. Verse 6, he buried him. Who's he? God. How much more could a person be in God's hand than to be literally buried by him? So yeah, Moses didn't get to go in. And the promise may have been way over there. And Moses was way over here. But he was still in the palm of God's hand. Scripture made that absolutely, undeniably clear. Say what you want. He didn't get to go in, but he was still in the palm of God's hand. His epithet does not read, he who didn't get to go in. And neither will yours. Neither will yours. If you know God's hand is in everything, you can leave everything in God's hand. 40 years working towards a goal and that would later be denied. And listen, now listen, this will really, I don't even know how to make sense of this because not only was it made clear on Mount Nebo that he would not go into the promised land, it was made clear that that's where he would die. That, that would be that wouldn't be the end of his journey to the promised land that was like the end of his journey that's kind of a lot to process Moses embraced his Mount Nebo moment After suffering the most devastating setback I think someone could have. And then, when we read it, we didn't read all that he said, but we read he turned around before he died and blessed the people. Did you read that? You can go back and read the whole thing in 33. He turned around after experiencing all of that with God. He then turned around before he died, came down for a little bit, and blessed the people. Friends, don't let your disappointments cast shadows on others' dreams. It's easy to be cynical. And it's easy to be silent. It's easy to be negative. It's easy to say, well, I tried that. Good luck. Oh, you get married? I've been married three times. Good luck. Oh, you going to work there? I hope you make it. Are you going to be a teacher? Are you going to be a plumber? Are you going to be a preacher? Good luck. Are you going to go to that school? Don't let your disappointments cast shadows on others. 
don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, you didn't get to go in. Your business idea didn't work out. Don't let your disappointments throw shadows on somebody else's dream. Okay, your relationship, it didn't work out. Don't, don't let your disappointment throw. Listen, every time, wants to rise up in you and you want to throw snark and you want to throw cynicism or negativity let that be a signal somebody hasn't come off of Nebo yet Let it be a sign that you up there on Pisgah, Pisgah Peak throwing rocks. The first time Moses struck that rock and while he was doing so, he was hurling curses at the people. How long must I suffer you, you faithless, godless people? After receiving probably the worst news and viewing the promise and taking in the worst disappointment of his life, he comes down and blesses the people. Why? Because what God has appointed is still power. Now listen, I, I don't know how to get to that place. I only know that if you let God in to your Nebo moment, he'll meet you there. Do what he does best. He will not leave you or forsake you. When the time is right, you'll be able to walk off that mountain too. But somehow Moses was able to stand in the midst of Mount Nebo and bless God and bless people anyhow. Now listen, friend. Now listen, here's the here's the here's the thing. Here's the thing. Moses, great man, <laughs> didn't get to land. But did you know that chapter 34 of Deuteronomy is, is not the Bible's last chapter for Moses? And that Mount Nebo actually would not be the last mountain Moses would stand. That if you go to Luke chapter 9, Verse 28, and about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him, and he went up into the mountain to pray. This mountain is traditionally known as Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is uh, north of Jerusalem on the inside. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face, meaning Jesus changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of a lightning. And two men, Moses, and Elijah appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus and they spoke about his departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. I'm curious. Where were they in that moment? Standing in the promised land. So I guess he got in anyway. Friend, there is no disappointment that 
Jesus cannot transform. There is no Mount Nebo that Jesus cannot turn into a Mount of Transfiguration. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, Jesus cannot somehow put his glory on and leave it unchanged and formed into something beautiful. Life's major disappointments are painful, but what God has appointed is all the more powerful. Would you bow your heads all across this room? Lord, I pray that there be a great release great release of sorrow shame there'll be a great release of self-condemnation and mistrust standing on their Mount Nebos today. Would you make your presence known? Would you make your presence real? And would you do your good work? transform that pain. Would you turn that place into a holy place? Healing, renewal, forgiveness. So that they may come off that mountain out of that disappointment transfigured transformed and made new made whole in Jesus name amen as you stand I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way worship team is going to lead us. I just want to encourage you. We have just a few more minutes left. If you're here this morning and this message has spoken to you, would you let us pray with you? Maybe you need to make a decision this morning for Jesus, a commitment to Jesus today. We want to pray with you. Don't miss this opportunity. Today, this message is dealing with some unresolved disappointment in your life. This is the moment. Don't miss this moment. Take a step of faith today. Let's, let's deal with it right now with God in prayer. So step out as they begin to sing. Let's pray together. Thanks for joining us again. We hope today's word was a blessing to you, maybe even challenged and inspired you. We'd love to connect with you, serve you in any way. Go to mynorthside.church, click the link for us to connect. We are praying for you. We believe that God has great things in store for you. We'll see you next time.